sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us this week for worship. And I'd like to take a moment to invite you to a special event that we're having this Sunday, August 28th, in the gymnasium of Citrus Ridge Academy. We're having Grammy and Dove Award nominee, Rhett Walker, for a great evening of worship and celebration. Citrus Ridge Gymnasium is just off of Highway 27 on Sand Mine Road, and the concert begins at six o'clock. Now, each week on our online service, we start out by singing a song together, and I want us to celebrate the goodness of our God. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that we can join together to look into your word and to look into your truth. God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us today by your spirit from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to week number three in our series from the book of Ruth. Some people might question why we spend time focusing on Old Testament narratives because we live under grace and we live under a new covenant from God. Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 15, 4, it says, whatever things were written before, which means the Old Testament scripture, were written for our learning that we, through patience and the comfort of scriptures, might have hope. You see, God wants us to live in hope, not to live in dread of the future, but to live in hope, no matter what we're experiencing or going through in this fallen world. That's why I've entitled this series, Ruth in Pursuit of Hope. 
What is hope? Well, it's a confident expectation. It's, it's saying, you know what? I know my God is good and my God is faithful and I know that he is going to see me through so we can live our lives with a confident expectation that God is for us and God is with us. And it's not just a confident expectation. It, the part of the definition of that word hope is that it's also a joyous anticipation. And that's the way we should live our lives. We should be so confident in the goodness of our God that we're happy about what he's going to do in the days ahead, no matter what we're experiencing right now. So we should live our lives in hope and in pursuit of hope. A confident expectation that comes with a joyous anticipation. Now, over the first two weeks, we looked at Ruth chapter one, verses one and two. I'd like to read those again together. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab... They settled there. So what are the things, the lessons that we've learned so far? Well, Bethlehem was experiencing a time of famine because God's people had turned away from God. They had quit obeying God. They had stopped loving and worshiping God. They had quit serving God. And we also found out that Bethlehem is in Judah, and Bethlehem means house of bread. And we talked about how bread was symbolic of the presence of God. So we learned this truth that the manifested presence of God that we experience through praise, because Judah is translated praise. That's what it means, even though it's a person's name, one of the 12 tribes, but it means praise. And we learned that the manifested presence of God experienced through praise is a staple for, for my and for your abundant, victorious life in Christ. And then last week we talked about this, the wrong direction. When we head in the wrong direction, running away from God, it always leads to the wrong destination. And when we find ourselves in the wrong destination, we shouldn't settle there. We shouldn't stay there. That's what Elimelech did with his family. And we ended last week by talking about you know, we don't need to stay in the wrong place doing what seems right in our own eyes and expecting a good result because we're not going to experience a good result. Let's look at the immediate result that took place from this bad decision. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, says this, Then Elimelech died. He ran away from God. He ran away from God's protection and provision and blessing. And he went to the land of Moab, a wicked people. And you know what? He ran away from God during times of trouble and he ran into compounded trouble. Now, Elimelech dies. And Naomi is left a widow with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One, where, one married a woman named Orpah and the other a woman named Ruth. So this bad decision had taken, now his family's living in a place where people are wicked and they're not living for God and honoring God and serving God. They don't, they don't respect God. God has never been acknowledged as the king of those people. Now they're living there, a widow and her two sons. And to top it off, now the two sons have married Moabite women. It says this in verse 3, or at the end of verse 4. It says, but about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. See, they settled there. They stayed there. They were out from under the protection of God and the provision of God and just trouble after trouble after trouble. Now Naomi is left there. Her husband has died. Her two sons have died. 
And that was the result of what choices they made. What choices Elimelech made to run away from God and the people of God during times of trouble. Let's pick up our story now in verse 6 of chapter 1. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. The famine is over. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. <clears throat> may the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye. And they all broke down and wept. No, they said. We, we want to go with you, to your people. So right now we're at another crossroads in the story. We're at a point where some choices are going to be made. We've already experienced some, some bad choices and we're shown how bad choices would lead you to the wrong destination. And you should never settle there. Now we're out of choice. Naomi is telling her daughters-in-law, don't go with me. Don't go with me back to the place of God's blessing, the promised land. Don't go with me. Go back to Moab. So there's some choices to be made. In verse 11, the story continues. But Naomi replied, why should you go with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? I mean, this was the custom during this time. If someone passed away, if, if a brother died who was married to a wife, then one of his brothers would take care of his wife and marry his wife, and she would become the wife of one of the brothers. But now both of Naomi's sons are dead. And she's explaining to her daughter, she's saying, can I give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? Then she goes on to say in verse 12, No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes. For I'm too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Then she said this, things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me and what she is saying to her daughters. I mean, I just have to stop right there and I've got to let you know and let you understand because we need to learn this lesson in this story. See, it's true that Naomi said that the Lord had raised his fist against her. It's true that she said it, but it's not a true statement. Yeah, I'm going to say that again. It's true that she said that, but just because she said that and it is accurately recorded in Scripture, it does not mean that what she said was a true statement. It just means that it's true that she said it. Naomi was at a place in her life where now she's thinking that God's not a good God and God's out to get her and God's out to hurt her. And here's, here's what I have understood by talking with people and, and uh, dealing with people in situations. You know what? It's real easy for people when tragedy happens, it's real easy for them to get mad at God or to begin to blame God for the trouble that's in their lives. Now, in this case, I mean, we looked at where trouble comes from. Sometimes trouble comes from our own mistakes. Sometimes trouble comes from the mistake that somebody made that we're connected to. Sometimes trouble just comes but just because we live in a fallen world. But we know in this case, 
in Naomi's life, this trouble was self-inflicted by her and her husband. Leaving God and the people of God, leaving His protection, leaving His provision, leaving His blessing, they just opened themselves up for death and destruction by living their lives by what seemed right. And now she's bitter and she says, my life from here on out, my life is just going to be bitter because God's against me. God has raised his fist against me. And this is something that we need to learn. When, when we reap a harvest from the garden that we have planted, we shouldn't get mad at God or blame God. Now, you might say, well, where did you get that theology from? Well, I got it from the Bible. Genesis 8, verse 22, says this. Right up in the beginning, God set up seed time and harvest. And he says, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. So when we look at this life on earth, we need to think, as long as this physical life lasts, there's going to be seed that's planted. There's going to be time for that seed to grow. And then there's going to be a harvest of that seed. And you might say, now, wait a minute, Dean, this doesn't apply. This doesn't apply to this story. This is talking about actual physical seeds. And you're stretching it to say that it has to do with the decisions that Elimelech and Naomi have made. And that's what they've harvested from the choices and from the decisions that they made. Well, I beg to differ because if we look in the New Testament in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, it says this. He says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. And then listen to the description. It says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So it's not just talking about physical seed planting in the ground. It's talking about the choices and the decisions and our priorities in life, what, what are we sowing? What are we planting? Because there, there's always going to be seed. There's going to be time. There's going to be harvest. And I like to put it this simple. If you want corn, don't sow watermelon seeds. <laughs> I mean, that just makes it simple, right? You would think I was crazy if I sowed, if I planted watermelon seeds and then expected to harvest corn. If I plant watermelon seeds, what am I going to harvest? I'm going to harvest watermelons. And it's crazy to think that I'm going to sow watermelons and harvest corn. Just the way it's crazy to think that I sow all my decisions, all my choices are just to satisfy my flesh and my own desires. And, and I have nothing to do with God. I'm not living for God. I'm not worshiping God. And I'm just all about me. And I'm sowing things to my flesh to think that my harvest is going to be some spiritual harvest of everlasting life from the Holy Spirit or abundant life or victorious life or the blessed life. No, <laughs> we're going to harvest what we sow. So if you look at your life today and you say, Dean, I don't like where my life is. I don't like the harvest that I am reaping today. Chances are, almost definitely, that the harvest that you're reaping today is a result of the seed that you planted in a previous season. And remember, there's always going to be seed and time and then harvest. So let's don't look at it in the negative way. Let's look at it in the positive way. What do you want to harvest next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now? What do you want to harvest then? 
If you want to harvest something different than what you're harvesting today, well then you need to start planting different seeds so that you will have a different harvest. Because there's always seed, then there's time, and then there's harvest, and at the proper time, whatever we sow, we're going to reap. And I like to look at it in a good way instead of a bad way. I mean, I know there's times where somebody's getting something bad and you say, you reap what you sow. But I, hey, it can be in a positive light too, that we can reap what we sow. And if we sow to please the Spirit, if we live to please the Spirit, then we're going to harvest everlasting life from the Spirit, is what the Bible says in Galatians. Let's go back to her story. Ruth chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And again, they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And the Bible says when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. See, Naomi had said, nothing but bitterness ahead for me, and I want you to go back to your mother's houses. I want you to go back to Moab. I want you to go back to your old gods that you used to worship and know before we told you about Yahweh. And I want you to go back and and find husbands, and I hope you have a great life. But you know what? Ruth made a different choice than Orpah. And as we wrap up this week's message, I, I want us to take a look at the seeds that were sown by the choices that were made in the lives of the main characters of the story. Let's start out with Elimelech, the, the patriarch of this family unit. See, Elimelech made a choice. He planted a seed to run away from God and to run away from God's people in a time of temporary trouble. He, he chose to leave the house of bread. He chose to leave Bethlehem, and it was in Judah. He chose to leave praise. He chose to leave the manifested presence of God and leave praise. He chose to leave Bethlehem and Judah, and he chose to focus on physical, short-term physical needs for him and his family. He chose to focus on that instead of focusing on spiritual and eternal needs of his family. And we see what harvest that brought in Elimelech's life. Now, let's look at Naomi's choices. Well, she chose to discourage her daughters-in-law. She said, no, I want you to go back. I don't want you to go with me. She chose to blame God for her troubles. Those are some bad choices. Those are some bad seeds that she's planted in the ground. But she planted a good seed in the ground, too, because she chose to return to Bethlehem and Judah. She chose to return to God and God's people. We can look at it that way. So she's planted some bad seed. She's planted some good seed. And we're going to see how the harvest comes up in her life. Then let's take a look at Orpah's choices. We didn't hear a whole lot about Orpah, but we do know the seeds that she planted for her future by the choices that she made. See, she chose to return to Moab. Now, she was influenced in that choice by what Naomi told her, but it was still her choice. She chose to return to Moab. She, she chose to, 
live in her past or to go back to her past instead of staying with the God that she had learned about from her husband and from Naomi. So she chose ultimately to deny God and to return to the false gods that the, her people in Moab, the gods created by the wicked imagination of man, she chose to go back to that. So she planted some pretty serious seed, some bad seed. And there's going to be time and there's going to be a harvest, but this is the last we hear of Orpah. We don't know actually what became of her and how it worked out for her but we know that she planted some bad seed. Now let's, let's take a look at Ruth. Because Ruth planted some good seed. Here's, here's what she did. She chose to go with Naomi. She chose to be faithful. Even though her husband had died, she chose to be faithful to her widow mother-in-law. She chose to go with Naomi. She chose to turn away from her past and not go back to what she came out of. She chose to go with Naomi. She chose to worship God. And that's a very powerful statement when she says, hey, look, Naomi, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Where you live, I'm going to live. Your God's going to be my God. Your people is going to be my people. I'm even going to die where you die. She, she showed this great level of love and commitment and you know what? She had heard enough about the God of eternity and the God of Yahweh, the God of the Jews and, and all that. She heard just enough to say, I'm staying with you and your God is going to be my God. I'm not going back to those false gods that my family used to worship before I found out about the true and the living God. I choose to worship God. So Ruth has planted some really good seed. And as the story progresses, we're going to see the wonderful harvest that comes. That's going to be, it's going to be a time later. It doesn't happen in the next day or the next week or the next month. There's going to be time that's between all this because there is seed and then there's time and then there's harvest. But Ruth has planted for a future that's greater than she can even imagine what the harvest is going to be for her. Now, I want to end this week by letting you know something and reminding me of something that each one of us, we're always one choice away from a different life by the decisions that we make, by the choices that we make, we're, we got to remember that we are planting seeds that are going to be harvested in our future. And we need to make sure that we're using that for our good in a positive way. We need to be, we need to be planting seeds to live for the Spirit of God and live for God. And then we're going to see a great harvest in our lives, just like Ruth is going to see. Harvest of abundant life, victorious life, and everlasting life. Let's pray together. God, I thank you. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the things that we are learning. And as we discover these things, God, I thank you for the hope that's going to rise on the inside of us so that we can live our lives in hope. Looking forward to the spiritual harvest because we're sowing to the Spirit in our choices and the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our family. If today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? I mean, it's so simple. All you have to do is hit that share button right under the video. In doing that, you'll be coming alongside of us and our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. We look forward to seeing you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.